as we heard in the last panel about wellness, lighting is a key component of wellness plans. Building upon that fantastic discussion, we are now diving deep into the importance of lighting plans. I'd like to introduce Laura Van Zell, Vice President of Lighting, Dallas Market Center and Lightovation. A little bit about Laura. She's been a lead leading figure in the lighting home and design industry since 1993, initially as an editor for residential lighting. Since 2016, Van Zell, Van Zell why am I calling you your last name? Laura <laughs> has managed the Dallas Market Center's Lightovation, the largest residential lighting show in North America, taking place each January and each June. And she also launched a new annual commercial lighting event at Dallas Market Center called the Arc Light Summit, taking place this September, right? Yes. Laura, thank you. And uh, we will welcome the panelists to the stage, and Laura will introduce them. That was their cue. Here we go. <laughs> well, thanks, Leanne. Hello, everyone. We're glad that you're here, and I'm excited to be moderating this panel today. Today, we'll be exploring one of the hottest topics in the kitchen and bath industry, or really any industry where you need to be able to see or you know want your environments to look good, and that's lighting. This session is called Well Lit, the importance of lighting in every design project. We'll be discussing how to approach designing the perfect lighting scheme, how to integrate lighting into whole home systems, and how to coach clients to understand the design possibilities with lighting so that they'll be thrilled with their results. With our expert panel, we're, we're going to be going beyond just selecting fixtures so that you'll understand the science behind lighting design and have some solid takeaways that you can apply to your next projects. So let's meet our experts. We have Peter Romanello, IALD owner of Conceptual Lighting, Mark Langston, Chief Lighting Advisor, Light Can Help You, and Kelly Finley, founder and principal designer of Joy Street Design. So before we get going, um, I just want to note that we will have a Q&A period at the end of this session, so you'll have an opportunity to ask our panelists any questions you might still have. So let's get started. Um, let's start with the fundamentals um, of lighting design with our lighting designers. What, do, what should every kitchen and bath designer or interior designer know about lighting? A lot. <laughs> How do you boil everything down to about three or four minutes? Um, there's a lot. I think that the hardest thing about lighting is that lighting is a combination of architectural lighting, which is things that you don't want to see, and decorative fixtures, which you do want to see. And, and so it's, it's achieving that balance of both, right? And when you think about a kitchen, the most challenging part about it is that it has to perform so many different levels of needs, right? Getting into your kitchen at five o'clock in the morning to make coffee is very, very different in terms of what you need the lighting to do than having a party or cooking dinner or having the kids do homework there. So there's actually a lot that you would have to consider um, in designing it. And then did you have anything to add to that, Mark? Yeah, that's absolutely correct, Pete, on that. It's the flexibility in any space is, is really important. How do we really use lighting to be able to help people maneuver around the space, to be able to do different tasks? It has to be flexible. And so much with lighting now is technology. It's a digital you know, uh, product nowadays, and so it's moving very quickly, and the technology just keeps marching forward. And so how do you kind of stay you know, at the front edge of that, and I always say that, uh, you know, you don't want to be the tip of the sword because it's very painful there, but you want to be somewhere near the, the, the front of it and be able to use the technology to your advantage to be able to have an environment that's very dynamic. I mean, lighting is the only thing in there that changes, and we have total control of how we do that with natural light and electric light to be able to blend that together to really tie in the design with what's happening outside and how people experience the space. Did you have some examples you wanted to show? Yeah. Um, so illustrate some of the concepts? This is actually a really good example of, of how you have a combination of decorative fixtures and architectural lighting. And, and I would also say that there's not a, a kitchen design in the world that's perfect, OK? There's always issues. We have these things called joists and ducts and pipes that get in the way of exact placement of fixtures. Um, but you know, I think that when, when we look at LED technology, one of the things that has uh, been good about it, certainly, is that we can do things that we never did before. But I also, I, I kind of try to encourage people to understand that technology does not replace good design. 
you have to have good design principles, you have to have good design basics before you get into, hey, it would be great if I could do this just because it's LED. But, but when we look at LEDs, there are really four things that you have to be concerned about. And, and you know, if we go back to the good old days of incandescent and halogen, that was easy. There were no choices of color temperature. Everything dimmed well. It was just like, yep, this is the light I use all the time. It's, it's piece of cake. But now we have to think about things. And, and, and honestly, the four things that are most important to think about are color, dimming, distribution, and glare control. And that's actually true of architectural fixtures and decorative fixtures. But when you think about it, those are the four things that most people are going to complain about as well. So we understand that if color is not right, people are going to hate it. And, and that's actually their choice, right? You know, we get kind of caught up in whether somebody likes 2,700 Kelvin or 3,000 Kelvin. It's their eyes. Their eyes are different than my eyes. And so I think it's important to show somebody. Um, dimming is, is obviously easy. We think that something is going to dim from 100% down to zero. But that's not true with LEDs. They're going to dim from 100 to something. And what is that something? And how do you explain that to your clients? Um, glare control, obviously nobody wants glare. So when you have a recessed fixture where the light source is right at the bottom, that's not good. And all of those things that are like these slim surface mounts, by the way, that's not a recessed fixture. That's a slim surface mount. So don't use something that's not what you want. And the last thing, distribution. Distribution's really important because, and it gets a little bit technical, which we won't do today, but that's about how much light. What is the spread of light, right? What's the beam spread? Certainly, if you were thinking about something being a wide spread of light, well, widespread, we have a connotation of what that means. But in the lighting industry, flood is actually 40 degrees. 40 degrees is this. I do this all the time with my clients. That's not wide flood. How many of those do you need to get something to be, to be moderately even, right? So, of course, the technology people are here, and technology is not working. but. Here. <laughs> you can see down here, I think you point that way. Yeah, not going anywhere. Not going. So we'll just keep staring at this one. So. <laughs> we'll go back. We'll try it again. There, there you we go. go. Yeah. All right. So, you know, distribution, if you look at the cabinets on the right, your right side of the screen there, that's a wide distribution of light. So a lot of times when I take pictures of things and, and examples, it's more about the quality of illumination, right? So you can imagine if that was an 80 degree beam spread, which it is, that's creating a soft wash of light on a cabinet. But if I cut that beam spread in half, and that was now four or five scallops of light, that either looks good or it doesn't look good. I don't like scallops of light. I hate them, personally, because I think that that detracts from the cabinets, right? So, and even when you look at the under cabinet lighting there in the middle, it's very even. It's a good level of light, right? We don't have lots of little scallops. So I always think a linear fixture should be linear in a linear application. Wow, it really doesn't like it. All right, Once here you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so what are some other, like, in, to take, you know, to take the concepts of what you need to understand about lighting and apply that to create a lighting scheme? Mark, do you have thoughts on that? Yeah, it's interesting with um, everybody's knowledge of what lighting is and you know, how do they actually interact with the space. Most people don't really understand what lighting is and you know, uh, what, they, what is good lighting and you know, what do they have in their city. They either like it or they don't. They really just don't have much of an understanding. So I think the first thing is to really get a baseline, understand, them have a baseline understanding of what good lighting is. And one of the ways to do that is to show them what bad lighting is be able to give them an understanding because we use this analogy a lot because this is what is in almost every home, whether it's a $300,000 home or a $10 million home. And so if we help people understand what it is that is good lighting, which is really putting lighting on things that are important and being able to show textures. As you all pick out these materials, uh, the colors, the texture, we want to make sure and be able to show that and be able to help people understand what that looks like. And to be able to kind of go through these different spaces, you know, the kitchen is the heartbeat of a home. And to be able to show to kind of a typical lighting, I look at, you know, dozens of plans a week and they almost all look the same. Uh, there's very little variation. 
and a lot of times it's just an architect putting a plan out to be able to get a uh, getting permits done and it's not really a lighting design and so it looks something like this which looks pretty decent but when you go and you put the lights in the right place and you be able to pick out the texture be able to draw people through the space because the beauty of lighting is we can really control the emotion of the space we can control the energy of what's happening in the space and we can take people from being super excited engaged in the space to a totally relaxing environment or we can do vice versa when if we do the wrong color temperatures Pete I love what you said about color temperatures because people will say hey what's the best color temperature I don't know what you're doing in the space let's talk about how you're using the space because we're experiencing the environment in a way that is so unique and we can just really control so much of how uh, everybody has experienced that space depending on what it is that we're doing with lighting. You know, the, the having the wide floods that you're talking about is great to be able to show off individual areas, uh, you know, as, as general spaces. Here you'll see it's a little bit more dynamic in that we're, we're lighting specific things to be able to throw, show drama. Uh, you know, there's a, a bit of a theater that can happen with lighting design and how you uh, be able to use that space. But you have to know the clients to be able to understand what they want to do with the space. Nobody is the same in how they uh, experience lighting. My wife and I, not the same. Our design studio, we do surveys and we, none, we never all come out with the same thing and we're all the same profession. So it's tough to be able to kind of understand what people want and you have to ask a lot of questions to be able to, to, to get to know what it is that they want to experience that because my prescription for their lighting may be totally off if I don't know how they're going to use it. You just brought up a really good point, Mark, about how everybody has a different opinion. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's something that's really important, right? <laughs> if design was easy, then they'd all be the same, right? And, and so when you think about the analogies to a kitchen, everybody has a different design. If you took all of you and said, okay, here's a room that's 16 by 20, you're gonna come up with, inevitably, 50 or 60 different designs. But they all have good principles you all have your work triangle, you all meet the client's needs, right? And so when we think about what we do, we're meeting our client's needs and we're, we're using really, really good technique, but that doesn't mean that my approach is right and your approach is wrong, or your approach right. is wrong and your approach is right. It's like th there is subjectivity to design as long as you use good technique. So I'm interested to know from an interior designer perspective how you approach creating lighting plans for clients? I think for as an interior designer, we approach it a little bit differently, right? So every project, for us at least, starts with function and space planning and light planning and all the things kind of behind the wall or behind the cabinets, right? But then we take it to the next level and we make design decisions. So while it may be <laughs> that we should have you know, 20 four-inch cans in this kitchen, I don't want to see that. <laughs> and so therefore, we adjust and make changes based on that. I know that, at least for, for me, the proliferation of the six-inch cans in the 90s and the 2000s makes me hate them. And if a client comes to me or they have a house and they're like, oh, it's not that bad, we're taking them out, right? Okay. So then that means how many more cans do we have to add? How many other things that we have to do. So I think when we approach it, it's really a little bit of making sure that we have the lighting for sure, but then kind of taking a step back and figuring out how we can make it feel better, but also keep the actual important parts of it. I think, did I have, have some, some pictures? Examples? Oh, yeah. okay, there we go. Um, the other element of it, which we get to have more fun with than you all do, are, you know, kind of like you said, the the jewelry in the room, the sconces, mm -hmm. the um, pendants, um, the lamps. So I will tell you now that unfortunately, we evidently typically mock out all of our recess lights and our professional images. So I promise that most of these kitchens have a lot more light than these images are showing. <laughs> um, but this is a good example. To the left of that picture on the left, I mean, the, the one on the left, there is actually two more pendants over the island, and then the entire island, the perimeter, has recessed light. So there's just so many more elements um, that really allow us to use it in a way that is, is decorative, but it also is obviously illuminating. Mm -hmm. um, 
this is a good, to me, a good example of using, also using lights where we don't need them just because they're pretty. <laughs> um, like in this bathroom on the left, we have recessed lights, we have sconces above the mirrors, and then we have that gorgeous fixture above the tub, the tub which it actually is my house. So I will tell you, I turn that thing on maybe twice in five years. Um, but it's gorgeous. And so those, those are the elements, though, that when I turn it on, when I remember, it also creates a new mood in the room because I am able to do that. So I think we think of all those things. We just think about it in a different way that is really mo mostly about what it looks like. <laughs> um, and the, the picture on the right is actually one of my a, a fun project we did. It was a new build, so we didn't do any structural work for the most part. And this room had no lighting in it. Um, and so what we were, ended up doing was creating lighting through lamps. And I think that's something that a lot of people with new builds or renovations get super overexcited about recessed lights to make sure you can see everything. Oh, okay. But every room doesn't need to be illuminated, right? Like, every, like I'm not a big fan of recessed lights in bedrooms unless it's like for a child that's doing homework. But you don't need to see as much as you need to see in a kitchen in a bedroom. So a lot of times we have to really talk our clients through the different things so they can think about how they're really going to use the room. But you have a lot of natural light coming in right. there. Right, exactly. So. And I mean, honestly, it's the, the trick of the picture, but yeah. <laughs> um, Wait, you do that too? <laughs> <laughs> so this is a good example too. Um, this kitchen has a lot going on, but it's a lot of under cabinet. And that's what I'm saying. My pictures don't show the actual lighting. Um, but there are recessed cans in the ceiling. There's this lovely pendant over the sink. There's under cabinet lighting. I think there's even lighting under the countertop, but I can't remember. It might, we might have taken it out. But this just shows you, like, you could just do so many things um, in a space. So, Kelly, that's important oh. because that, you know, putting the lighting into the architecture, so you don't just have down lights. You can actually hide it away. LEDs are so small now. It really gives us a lot of different tools, so we don't have to just use down lights. As a matter of fact, down lights should support everything else if you need to have the extra light. Mm -hmm. So yeah. you, you, you hit it spot on there. And, and down lights are really, they're the easy way out, Yeah. right? When, when you really think about design, it's how do you integrate it? So, so you should actually like try to integrate as much as possible. Mm -hmm. And recess light should not be your knee jerk reaction. It should be kind of the, the last thing, mm -hmm. you, need, you know? Supplement. Like, yeah. Right. yeah. So yeah, these are just other kitchens that we've done where we, like I said, we have these, Evidently, somebody else took these pictures and then did not crop out the recess so you can see yeah. them. We have all of the island pendants. I love the first kitchen on the left with the extra sconces above. And that, when those are on um, by themselves, it's just a, such a nice evening, like, you know, dinner's over, and it really creates a great environment. Um, I think that's it for me. Oh, no, I'm still talking. Um, sorry. <laughs> I will skip that one. So the one last thing I wanted to say is the picture on the left is a great picture in that this one had recessed cans, but because they wanted the kitchen to kind of fade away, even though it had this massive hood, mm. we ended up also doing perimeter lights. So there's a channel that's going around the exterior of the, um, the room, in every room, to avoid having, just to have that other element of light. And we've been doing a lot of that where people, me, don't want any recessed lights in the room, we'll put a channel in the drywall and we can have a LED or something that can come around. And even if you're really having fun, it could be a colored LED like for a kid's room and they can play with that as they um, are there. Mm -hmm. Oops. Uh, back. So thinking about um, explaining lighting to clients and what they need to understand about lighting, especially if we want them to prioritize lighting as much as other elements in their project, how can we, how can designers um, explain lighting to clients or what are things that they need to help clients understand? So I, I think that the first thing is that you should try to show them as much as possible. Like lighting is very difficult because it's intangible. So as interior designers and kitchen and bath designers and architects, you can show people something. You have physical items that people can touch, they can hold it in their hands, they can look at it hanging, if it's a hanging decorative fixture, and they can say, I like that or I don't like that. When, when you talk about architectural lighting, you know, people sometimes, not us, people get, get um, kind of bogged down in, oh, it looks like there's too many lights. 
but, but I think it's important to understand what is it doing, right? And, and a fixture has to have a purpose or you take it out, right? So, so this gets kind of into the whole technique thing, but I think that you know, when, when I try to show clients, you're obviously not going to mock everything up. You can't take a kitchen and say, well, I'm going to put four lights you know, as a sample in front of this cabinet and see what it does. So, so over you know, 25 years, I've got a bunch of pictures. And, and so you try to show things. You try to explain to people. Like even in the picture of the, uh, of the kitchen right before this, where it was the, the kind of smoke blue cabinets, like I look at that, and uh, right, it's the one on the right. My immediate reaction is that the left cabinet is lit, the middle one where the stove is is not lit, and the one on the right is lit. And so I look at that and I say, well, that means that the middle cabinet's going to be dark. So I would have a third light there, right? So, so part of it is you have to be able to predict what a fixture is going to do. And if somebody comes to me with a set of plans and the fixtures are spread too far apart, I need to be able to look at that and understand immediately what that's going to do to the surface that I'm lighting and then explain to them. Because if then they say, well, I don't want a third fixture there, great then you're going to have lit cabinet, dark cabinet, lit cabinet. Are you OK with that? And let them answer it, because mm. it's their house. Yeah, very true. And I think you know, what it really comes down to is, is how you look at uh, the space. And if you look at it from a reflected ceiling pl uh, plan, you don't really understand what's right. happening in the space, right? <laughs> and so uh, that's where we see you know, just there's, there's these formulas that, and I don't know exactly where they came from, but every house you see this just sea of downlights and what you don't like it's like you know we have a, a home we're working on now that i look i wasn't even sure what these dots were on the ceiling there were so many of them in this home and high-end fixtures and so we've been asked to go through and, and make a change and if we could play that little video clip that would be helpful so you know we talk about client and if you think about you know it's playing. if you think about the homeowner it's really two people. We have two clients most of the time, right? We have the husband and the wife, for example. It's not like we have one person we're trying to show about what's happening with lighting. So we use this technique to be able to sketch in, to be able to show different ideas, to be able to help everybody be on the same page. Because no two people, you know, if I try to express lighting, they're not going to know what I'm talking about until I show something in pictures. And so we can figure out what people like. You know, people talk about, I want brightness in the space. You know, I don't know what that means exactly. You know, when you say brightness, what do you want? Does it mean glare? You know, some, I don't think so, but most people will say a lot of light coming out of the fixture. So if we can help everybody in the design process be able to have the same thing to be able to take a look at, and so we can make edu educated decisions. Hey, do you like this or do you like that? Uh, tell me about what's happening in the space. Tell me, is there artwork going in? We want to light things first, right? We want to follow the money. If they're spending money on it, we want to light it. And so the more we know about people and how they're going to use the space, the better we can actually come up with the lighting design. When people ask you know, about, hey, what's the color temperature? What's the technology? What is all that? You can't answer that until you know about the space. Do you entertain a lot? You know, how, uh, how versatile do you want it to be? Do you have you know, kids that you're doing homework with? You know, what are the different environments that you're, that you're involved in? Then you go to a technology to solve a problem or to be able to create an experience. So often, lighting design is done from a technology, I'm going to apply this technology, that is the wrong approach. Right. And so you don't even need to talk about fixtures, really, until you get way down the line and you understand uh, how you want to use that space. Do you have anything to add from the interior designer perspective, Kelly? No, I think that totally makes sense. It, it, it goes back to the, my point I made earlier about we sometimes get, I guess it's probably some of you, we had an architect send a lighting plan and um, all we could do was laugh, right? There was literally so many, so many circles that it didn't seem right. Like it seemed like we were reading something different. Um, and what we really are, I would say no client, I feel like we very rarely have clients that want less fixtures. It's us saying that's too many. So I think there's this over correcting that a lot of people do when they've lived without light for so much, so long, that when they finally can add something, they're like, oh my God, I want every can in the world and I want to be able to see every corner. And I'm like, do you need to really like, you know, and I think that it's just really on us 
and probably not you all wouldn't like it all the time to take some things out and just say, it's okay if you don't see that cabinet. It is perfectly okay. Your, your ceiling will look better. Or you can make that choice, right? I'm suggesting this, and yeah, there is a trade-off, but the trade-off is design, and we always think design wins. <laughs> well, there's got to be the contrast of light and dark to really understand where you have light. Mm -hmm. And so if everything is just flooded with light, there's no visual interest. So right. you have to have that combination. But I think most clients would love everything just flooded with light. I don't think most people understand that kind of interplay. And, and that interplay is important. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, there's a, there's a really, really big difference between lighting design and a lighting plan or a lighting layout, right? A lighting layout is that buckshot approach, right? Somebody sitting there with AutoCAD says, I want to do an array four feet apart in this direction, five feet apart in this direction. Yep. And you get awful, awful lighting, flat, boring, uninviting, uninspired lighting. We're all designers, right? So, so if you approach lighting that way, you're not giving the importance to it that you give to every other aspect of what you do on a daily basis. It's not just a bunch of circles. It's not just a bunch of, quote, cans, right? They actually do something. And so thinking about what happens when the illumination comes out of that fixture is incredibly important because that stops you from then just having flat, boring light. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of technology and there's calculations that go on in the background, but most people don't care about that or they just don't care. You're going to bog them down in stuff that doesn't matter. What's it going to look like? How flexible is it going to be? And then we do the calculations behind the scenes. There's a lot that goes into that, but it doesn't have to be shared, all of that. You know, it just it doesn't make sense to, to do that, really. I think the other one thing we haven't mentioned is the new technology that is out. I think that a lot of lighting manufacturers are making it so it's a little bit simple, a simpler to make adjustments in the field, right? Like even think about LEDs, how you can change the um, the harsh, like everything about the light and the color, just simply by moving something inside the can, right? And those those are things that you wouldn't have ever been able to do before. There are a lot of like. I, we've, we've been spec specifying a lot of um, like the square cans that have a different kind of illumination. They allow you to move things. And those are things that I don't recall seeing, you know, five, ten years ago, where now to the extent you don't, you forget to light something, you may be able to move the light a little bit so you can get to that corner that you hadn't really considered before. So it's a lot of things, I mean, along with the real tech where you can come in and say, I'm going to bed and the tech turns off your lights, right? Those are the really, but there are a lot of people I think who are making advances so it becomes a little bit easier to make adjustments in the field too. And that's stuff, the tech, you know, is there is a lot there. You know, we can, we can control the color of the light. We can change it from warm to cool throughout the day. And again, you have, you know, these, the client who one of your clients is going to be technologically advanced and love all the bells and whistles. And if, if it can sing and, and make music come out of the light, we want to do that. And then there's that's the other one that wants to push the button. And I just want a button to push to turn it on. So how do we, how do we actually create solutions for both types of people that are experiencing that home. That is where behind the scenes we have to take that technology and make it simple for people to be able to get to and for that person that really wants to dial in that color temperature uh, it makes a, a lot of sense because that sunlight that's coming in is going to we see it as being very white but it's actually very blue in its color temperature. And so if we use these warm color lamps, it's like 2700, I'll throw a number out. We use that inside. If you have white finishes, like you have a white kitchen, it's gonna look totally dingy because its light is relative. And so that, that ability to be able to do that, changing the color to be able to match what's happening with the natural light coming in, because we wanna harness all of that. You know, that's the first, you know, first gift is light. And so to be able to have that natural light and use it, and then your images with all the, the, the natural light, bringing that in and being able to fill in the dark spots is, is really kind of the key uh, to be able to use that natural light. And I'm sure and, you guys do. Yeah, that. and Kelly, you brought up two really good points that I wanted to point out. The first thing is adjustability in a fixture. Adjustability means being able to tilt it and rotate it, right? So that, that's old technology. That's been around <laughs> since 1980. Okay. It just looks better now. Uh, it's better now, <laughs> right. 
and, and then the other thing is the ability to change color temperature, right? So, so think about even in a lot of your images, they were cooler colors, mm -hmm. right? If you take that purple wall and you light that with 2700 Kelvin, it's going to make it much more of a warm purple. But if you intended it to be a cooler purple, you, that's not going to happen, right? So, so the thing about the adjustability, you know, I actually think that all recess fixtures should be adjustable. You should have that adjustability in the fixture. If it aims straight down, great, right? But, but the point is that, a, I hate to say the word, a can demeans what it is. We all say it, right? <laughs> but it's a recess light. In reality, a can literally goes back to the 80s where it was a, what looked like a coffee can with a socket in it and two hanger bars. That is not something that's adjustable. That's not something that dims well. That's not something that has great color temperature or the ability to change color temperature, right? So I, I'm, this is you know, my little soapbox here because I'm only 5'7". You know, it's important to say what it is. It's a recessed light. And, and when you demean something and you say it's a can, then that connotates a $20 fixture from a home center, okay? Do you call your cabinets a box? No. <laughs> You get really, really specific about it, what it is. And the reality is that a can would be like putting laminate product for your countertops. You don't do that in your kitchen most of the time, right? So we have to kind of elevate the game a little bit because the quality of the lighting has to be equivalent to the quality of everything else that you did in the kitchen. And when we demean it by saying it's a can, we're, we're making it really, really hard to get a client to understand, well, maybe I need this thing to be adjustable, but maybe I need it to have color temperature tuning and all that, mm -hmm. so. Yeah. I'll say the one thing that you just mentioned is that we typically don't pick paint colors or in, like, that's the last thing we do. Like, I want the room to be put back together. I want to see how it lives. I want to see the blue cabinets next to the wall before I pick a color. Um, and that allows us to kind of live with the room as it is mm -hmm. and pick a color based on that. Like that is one, there are what millions of paint colors. There's only like one tile, right, that you want. Right. So it makes no sense to be changing the light, in my opinion, to match the paint unless it's already there. And it's better when we're doing a renovation to have that be the last thing because the light from the window, the light from the recess light, all of those are gonna really play with that. I, I remember one of the first projects I did for myself is I painted the whole house like a grayish, like a light gray, but the kitchen wasn't in. And when the navy blue kitchen came in, my entire house was blue, yep. right? And it's just like little things like that. I've learned my lesson. And we now like really try to play with the more permanent fixtures and design the easy stuff after. Right. Yeah, what know, other um, issues have you encountered with lighting specifically on projects or how did how did you solve issues that you've had with lighting? Yeah, I think, you know, it's a co combination is, you know, there are things like joists. Mm -hmm. There's always a damn beam in the way and you can't have it symmetrical. Um, in one of the kitchens, um, the one that was gr greener, it actually uh, was supposed to not have, um, let's see if it's, oh, that's okay. Um, it was supposed to not have um, pendant lights because we wanted to keep it a little bit more open, but the, there were some sconces that couldn't be placed. So I think a lot of our problems are when we come up with what we think are great ideas and then we can't do them. I think the other problem, which I mentioned earlier, is not wanting to have um, a Swiss cheese kind of ceiling and trying to come up with new ideas to how to do it. Um, for example, I'm working on a project now and I didn't want any um, recess uh, lights and I wanted to put a channel essentially around the whole house, like the entire perimeter and put up um, LEDs and once, it's, but it's a pitch roof. And so to be able to do that, I was gonna have to put in like a soffit. It just turned into a whole nightmare. And so now that house will have recess cans, I mean recess lights. <laughs> um, so, so they're like you know sometimes they're just trade-offs, um, but generally I think it's kind of the clientele not wanting as much. We have a client I think. Sorry, my designer's right there too. We have a client that will not let us put a recess light in the house, and the house has eight foot ceilings. It is not large. We are constantly trying to come up with ideas to make that work. So it just depends on the client, and I really think it's 
for us probably it's a lot of new ideas, new trying to bring something different to the table so that every kitchen doesn't look the same and doesn't have the exact same length. Did your client did your client get attacked by a light fixture uh, downlight <laughs> one time? That's why they don't like it. I've never heard that. You know, I feel like maybe he grew up in a house and it was a light right over the bed or something. Like yeah. it's just a weird. He like good. is adamant <laughs> about. I don't even think in the bathroom we have any. In places that are, it's just very functional. It makes sense. He's just very much against it. And you know, there are a lot of designers who are doing a lot of those like little um, surface mounted lights. Um, and I've seen that, but then I still think it's a lot of surface mounted yeah, lights in the ceiling mm -hmm. that look a little weird. Um, so it's just a preference, right? It's, every designer has different things, and um, I have a couple weird things too. So. <laughs> there you go. What are some lighting solutions you would recommend to issues that she's encountered or that you encounter regularly? Go ahead. <laughs> so, you know, I've never had somebody say they didn't want any downlights. They want to kind of minimize it. So I, that's where I would kind of ask questions. It's like, so why don't you want to have downlights? <laughs> and it may be they had those little surface panels and they couldn't, and it was just glary. And so to, be, to find out, what do you mean by that? I say that a lot when I'm talking to, to clients. It's like, that's interesting. What do you mean by that? And so then I can understand more where they're coming from. And maybe they had this you know, whatever that maybe it was the light over their bed and it that whatever, and so uh, to be able to find out what it is that they're uh, really objecting to, and then I can come up with a solution to be able to help with that. Now, if they're just flat against downlights, that's great. We can work around that. You know, it's like what kind of architecture are you going to give me to be able to work with uh, if you're not going to let me use downlights? Can I put some coves in? Can we do a tray ceiling? You know, there's different things that we can do to be able to help solve that. And that's where that thing is, don't come in and say, you know, in my, you know, I never go in with an idea that this is what it's going to look like until I talk to the client. No clue, you know, it, it, what's going to happen with that particular house till we have a chance to talk to them. That's, what you that's an awesome point. And I think that, you know, our responsibility, again, some people think that lighting is very mechanical. We don't, right? <laughs> it's, it has to be tailored to each client. And, and again, while there are good practices and good techniques, I, my wife and I, you said, you know, your wife and I like things totally differently. When I'm not home, like this whole week, <laughs> my wife sits in our living room with a table lamp on, and that's it. And I go, Chris, what the hell are you doing, <laughs> you know? But when I'm there, I want to light up the artwork, and I actually don't want the table lamps on because I want it to be really, really low level, right? So, so getting to what your clients like comes through asking questions, right? And I think that also means asking questions of ourselves. Like when, when we sit down and we start working on a project, the number one question is what am I trying to do? And, and that's a macro question and it's a micro question, right? So if you think about a kitchen, the macro answer to that is I'm trying to create a space that is vibrant, multifunction, bright when it needs to be, dim when it needs to be, good for a party, good for coffee in the morning, right? The, the micro is, okay, I've got glass cabinets. How am I gonna like that? There's a lot of different questions that go in that. What are the shelves? What are they displaying, right? If, if, if you've got glass shelves and you have a bunch of opaque things like, oh, I don't know, a stack of plates, guess what happens when you put a light at the top? It's not getting through the plates. You might as well have wood shelves now, right? So we have to, again, like think about things on a very, very specific level and keep asking questions because that's the same thing that you guys do, right? And again, I think that, that because, you know, so many people are used to bad lighting and seeing bad lighting plans, they don't know what it's like to actually get a well thought out one, yeah, right? They don't know they have bad lighting. Correct. Yeah, they just have lighting and all lighting is bad. <laughs> it is. In their opinion. In their A opinion. equals B, B equals C. All lighting yeah. is bad, right? <laughs> so before we wrap it up, um, I want to ask each of you for your three best pieces of advice so that the audience can take away from this session something to apply to their business or their next project. Mark, we'll start with you on okay. that. Uh, don't go overhead dependency. Go layers of light. I mean, we love lamps, so we even light you know, we put lamps in our projects even though we don't have anything to do with lamps because we want that layer of light to be able to be there. And so don't light the floor, light something, and then fill in light as you need it. Uh, and then really just know your client, ask tons of questions, 
don't be afraid to ask one more question to be able to understand what they want and then get help when you need to help. It's a, it's a, lighting has gotten incredibly difficult. Our team studies every week. We, we do training with our team to be able to understand what lighting is. There's no way that uh, if you're not in the lighting industry that you could understand it all. Now, Kelly, why don't you give us some advice? Um, I would say lighting is jewelry. Lighting is the, like it is what you see when you walk. If you do it properly, it is what you see and notice when you walk into the room. So spend on it. Make sure you have a budget for it. Make sure you also have it reflect your personality um, and don't just go for something that you can pick up in any store. Um, that would be my number one tip. I think the other, I would agree with the layering of the lighting um, and just have fun. Like, yeah, we need it to work, but we also want, you really want people to come in and be like, oh my God, that fixture. So like one of the pictures with the purple wall, that fixture cost $200. The number of people that comment on that $200 fixture is unbelievable, right? And it was because it was perfect for the space, because it showed some personality. And so it doesn't have to be expensive, but it needs to be something that's interesting. So Pete, besides stopping calling them cans, what's the best piece of <laughs> so that me, I only need two more, right? And I've got to do different ones. Um, tailing on what, what you said about not lighting the floor, one million percent. You start with the perimeter and work your way in, no matter what room of the house it is. People look at walls, they don't look at floors, okay? If you want a room to feel bright, you light the walls or anything on the walls, and then you work your way in. The second thing I would say, uh, and please don't take offense at this, but we all have our specialties, right? You know what you know and you know what you don't know. And so if you, as kitchen designers, you look at, at kitchen plans that are done by an architect or an interior designer that maybe doesn't do them all the time, you sit there and you go, hmm, they probably should have brought in me, right? So if you don't know what good lighting is, then don't be afraid to ask. It's okay. Like there, there are people out here that do lighting every single day. And, and you know, I work with, we all do, we work with the greatest architects and interior designers in the country, okay? they know there's a point where they don't know what they don't know, right? And so they have to bring in somebody, and that's okay. So, so if you ever have any questions, just reach out to somebody, right? If you don't understand what a spec sheet says, if you don't know how to pick out a recessed light, call a lighting person and ask. And the last thing um, is, right, it is three. Um, don't forget, those lights are going in the ceiling. You got one shot, one shot to get it right. They're never moving, right? That house is gonna get redesigned, cabinets are gonna move, furnishings are gonna change, colors are gonna change, those lights are in the ceiling. And to Kelly's point, don't cheap out, because you're putting something in the ceiling that's gonna be there for a long time, right? Okay, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> so going back to your second piece of advice, just ask, we're at the Q&A portion of the session, so does anyone have any questions for our experts? Thank you, uh, everyone, for your time. Um, we've been hearing a lot of keywords uh, today, wellness, biophilia, human-centric. Um, I'm really fascinated uh, about circadian lighting, but right now that technology is incredibly expensive um, to put in. But are you seeing from your clients and from some of the trends that people are, are inquiring about this, um, and how does that affect the way that you're thinking about lighting spaces going forward? I, I think, I mean, I don't have clients specifically requesting that. I think there is an acknowledgement of wanting to wind down and how you wake up, and that's what we do it through technology and thinking about just dimmability and different things that allow them to do that. Um, nobody's asked, I don't know that much about like what kind of fixtures would do it or anything like that, but I definitely know that when we think about how you're gonna live in a house, we think about what is the, what should the room look like at 6 p.m. versus what does it look like at 6 a.m.? Go ahead. Yeah, I, it's a great question. And you know, my question would be back to that. What do you mean by you, you want circadian lighting? <laughs> Everybody has a different perception of what that is. And so you have to understand what that person is asking for. And what we have found is that it's just like Kelly says, it's really more from an aesthetic standpoint that we find, we do education with clients to say, we go through that with every client. You know, do you, 
health and lighting. Where does that fit in your scale of what's of, of interest to you? And then find out where they are with that. But, but most people, in, in my experience, is circadian lighting, they want it, but they don't want to pay for it. Correct. Now, if I can tell them that, like Kelly said, that your light is going to match what's coming in from the outside at 6 o'clock in the evening, and it's going to match at noon, is that something you'd be willing to pay for? Often they'll say yes, because it's an aesthetic that they're really looking for. And so to really kind of understand where that fits in, and you know, we're not doctors, so we can't say, hey, you're going to feel better and you're going to lose weight. Uh, we do know it, it increases stress and there's all the things we know, but you can't, really, you can't really position it that way. And so have a discussion, understand what it is they're looking for, and then reach out to be able to understand how to have that conversation. It's a challenging conversation, uh, even though we talk about it every day. And, and because of the cost, it's got to be done for the right reasons, right? So, so if you, you have to really understand circadian rhythm lighting and what that means. And, and honestly what it is, regulating our circadian rhythm is having lighting that basically mimics sun up to sundown, okay? But when you look at the studies about health and wellness, almost all of them that have any validity are based in commercial projects, assisted care facilities, hospitals, office spaces. Why? Because those people are in them for long periods of time and potentially without any daylight. And especially, especially about a, an assisted care facility, you have, let's say, patients that are trying to sleep at 2 o'clock in the morning, and you have nursing staff that has to be up and vibrant and awake. You have to reverse their circadian rhythm, right? But when you think about a residential environment, how many people are at home all day long? And if they are home all day long, how many of them are in rooms that don't have a lot of natural light, right? So I agree with what you guys both said, is that it becomes an aesthetic question. I, I, I describe it as bridging the visual gap. You're trying to bridge the gap between five to 6,000 Kelvin daylight and 2,700 to 3,000 Kelvin interior. So how do you balance that by bringing it up? It's an aesthetic question, but at $900 to $1,000 a piece, for a single recess fixture, which then you really can't call it a can, right? Yeah. Um, it's a jewel. That's expensive. So, so now does that recessed fixture package become a quarter of a million dollars in a house? That's really what you're talking about. And then you have to have a control system. Because if you ask somebody, hey, what color do I want it to be at 1 o'clock in the afternoon in December in Boston, they're not going to know. But when it's done correctly, you hit your keypad, and it turns on the lights that replicate what it's supposed to be at that geographic location at that time on that day. So it's a great thing. I just don't think it's ready for human consumption yet in a residential environment, unless somebody is willing to have you know, a certain type of money that says, I don't really care. Yeah, I want to do, do it. it. Yeah. Is tunability one way to kind of well, tunability, venture into that area without the, the cost? Like. So tunability is just what allows you to have circadian rhythm lighting. So you need a tunable fixture to be able to provide circadian rhythm lighting. So circadian rhythm lighting is, is the result of having a tunable fixture. But tunability is not the same as like a fixture that has set right. dip switch settings, yeah. right? Where you can choose and say, hey, in the kitchen, yeah, I got all these recess fixtures are all the same. I want the kitchen at 3K. I want the bathroom at 3K. I want the living room at 27. You s that's not variable, right? That's not tunable. That's just I'm selecting the color temperature. Yep. Are there any other questions? They were that thorough? Yeah, one. Okay. <laughs> I'll hold it. Yes. You mentioned in the beginning that you might be addressing the subject of glare and we do so many islands in kitchens. Um, can you give suggestions of specific ways to avoid, you know, besides, I know the material of the top, obviously, you know, the reflection and such, but do, can you give suggestions for fixtures that will eliminate that kind of glare? So. Do you mind? Go for it. Okay, so, so there's a difference between fixture glare and a glary reflection, okay? So the reflection on a, on a high gloss or specular surface is what's known as a veiling reflection, and it's a result of Snell's law. 
So what Snell's law say, states is that light reflects off of a specular or mirror-like surface at the angle of incidence. So if you think about that now, you have to understand, understand specularity, right? So if you have a high gloss countertop, you will see a reflection at the angle of incidence. So think about that with a, with a high gloss countertop. When you walk into the kitchen, you don't see that. But as you get closer to the countertop and you look down onto it, now you see that reflection because now you're at the, veil, at the angle of incidence. So there's really no way to avoid it. You can change the angle, right? So like in an under cabinet light, you would put it at the front facing towards the back so that the reflection goes away from you. If you put it at the back facing towards the front, you're putting that reflection right in your eyes. On an island, it's really, really difficult, right? But that also gets into the size of the island. And if you had, let's say, down lights right over the middle of it, depending on the size, right, you'd really have to lean into the island to be able to see that. Um, and countertops, I think the thing that's important is that it, you're never typically cutting on that surface. You're going to have a cutting board, and the cutting board typically isn't specular. Um, we, we, worry about, we worry about specularity when it comes to things like high-gloss cabinets, right? because those either look lit or not lit, depending on the angle of light. And then you can get some really nasty reflections off of that. Yeah, it's interesting. So that island, will you give me something I can hide some linear lighting in to have some indirect lighting? You know, it, you know they have to look for some different solutions to be able to do that. So I can get a lot of light indirectly, and I don't have any down lights that, sh that shine in there. I don't know if that fits into the architecture or not, because I haven't seen the plans. But it would be, you know, what, is, what can you give me to be able to hide something so I don't have to have the down lights in there? It's a give and take, right? It's like, you know, I love a, a client or a designer that says, you know, you have a palette to work with here, open palette. If you want me to have some coves in here, it's negotiable. And we can, we can have the discussion about where we can do that light. There's got to be flexibility. Good question. That's a good question. Are there any other questions? All right, well, thank you, Kelly, Mark, and Pete, and thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thanks, Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it.